So thank you everyone for joining. Um, as Dan said, I am from ECHOES. Uh, ECHOES is this innovation lab driven by design. We have different sides of the business, the School of Design Thinking and the Innovation Projects. Um, we work basically with design for accelerating innovation and for um, changing um, to create transformation, um, to make you create better digital products or, and, and many things. But today I'm going to be focusing more on the desi design for desirable futures, innovation for desirable futures. Okay, so if you have any other questions about other topics or other stuff, feel free to, to ask me later on. So I'm going to start sharing um, my screen, if that's okay. Um, and you let me know if you can see my screen. Hopefully you'll be able to see my screen soon. Megan, I saw that you're there. Thank you for joining as well. Can you see, can you all see my screen? Yeah, cool. So I'm gonna be talking about design and design of futures basically, right? And I divided this chat into three parts. So the first one is about the power of design. Um, we probably have many people here who are already converted, but I think it's interesting to, to show our perspective. How do we see design? How do we use design? Um, also, we're going to talk about this ever-changing world uh, that we are living in. And it's funny because at the beginning when I started um, giving this talk, um, it was a different world. And now um, the rate of change increased and amplified so much that it's interesting to see. And many of our projects that we work with different organizations uh, designing a desirable future, they are just fast tracking to the desirable future or fast tracking to a possible future. But our goal and our intent here, of course, as designers of the world that we want to live in is to create desirable futures and not, not just necessarily possible, possible accelerations of the future. And then the third part is what I was just mentioning now is about um, thinking uh, if you prefer to predict the future or if you prefer to create it, right? So, and, and again, please ask questions in the chat if you need. Um, so uh, a bit of me, uh, of my background, um, I am a designer, I am a product industrial designer at the time there used to be a thing called industrial designer, but I evolved into working to design research, then strategic design, then design thinking, then uh, now working with designing futures. Um, so it's quite of an evolution of design that follows also what kind of projects we do at ECHOS and how we are applying design in different, uh, let's say in different scales and in different needs of different organizations and working together with, with people and society basically. So the way how we see design and the power of design, right? So we, we really do think that um, we are all designers. And I think that the traditional designers might hate me, hate me for saying that, but I really do believe that every human being is a designer. Um, and the human evolution was basically facilitated by our ability to invent and reinvent tools. By creating tools, we're not only constantly evolving our skills, uh, but we're also developing new skills that generate intentional or no intentional results. So I think that what makes us humans is this ability to create change intentionally, right? And this is what makes us all designers. So that being said, we can be designers of a visual thing. Uh, we could be communicator designers, but we also could be um, product designers. We could also be industrial designers. We could also be strategic designers, cultural designers, systemic designers, and stuff like that. So we are all constantly, as humans, designing the world where we want to be, live in, the culture that we want to live in, the relationship that we want to live in. So that's why we are all designers. But the problem is that sometimes we are not intentionally designing things, right? Um, and because we're not intentionally designing things, it means that we are not choosing where we want to interfere in our own ecosystem or not. And I think this is the power of design, to be able to intentionally create change for better, whatever this thing is. And when I say whatever this thing is, because design um, evolved through the years, right? So at the beginning of the notion of what design was, we used to think a long time ago, the design was mainly the realm of graphic design, information design, communication design. It is the level of symbols of design. 
But then lately with the industrial revolution, we quickly evolved to industrial design that is about product and space architecture. And then later um, with the digital revolution, we started to think about design as in ways of interaction. So then it comes service design, experience design, behavioral design, digital design. And then lastly, we have been more and more finding ourselves as systemic designers, interfering cultures, organizational design, business design, and learning. So this is a reference uh, from Richard Buchanan, it's not mine, but that's how we at ECHOS see design and how we apply design. We think that the best solutions, they are not only focusing on one um, order of design, but actually are a great design or a great change actually involves thinking about of all the orders of design. So if you think about systemic change, there is always a symbol to it. So if you think about the image, for example, of, let's say, um, the feminist movement, it is systemic design, right? But there are symbols. So if you remember the posters of women empowerment, there is this level of design as well. If you think about Apple as a company, they have great design in systemic design in interaction design, but also in product, or also in symbols and information. And you're thinking about designing when we're thinking about changing the world where is our entry point so if you are someone who work in the innovation space where is your entry point to design a desirable future for yourself for your company for your product whatever for your society for your city whatever it is doing um, change by thinking more systemically sometimes start by changing the in this systems. So it's interesting to think about design in this more uh... All right. It looks like we've lost Juliana. Juliana, are you back? I was, I was just saying that it was showing my screen that my connection was unstable. Am oh, I back? Please. Can you hear me? You are back and you were in the flow as well, Juliana. So um, whilst you were gone, I shared the link to Richard Buchanan. So everybody had something to read whilst you were gone. <laughs> do, you want to, do you want to carry on? Welcome back. That's cool that you're there. Great, great. I'm just, uh, give me just one second. I might change my internet um, because sometimes this happens and it is nuisance. Um, so just so so me... Whilst you're doing that, something we do, something worth thinking about, guys, something we do when that happens in our workshops is we put up a big T for technical issues. We don't have the old cat or the late, uh, if you're from the UK, you'll remember the little girl with the doll that they used to bring on and the BBC when things went wrong. We don't have one of those screens. So, uh, <laughs> uh, Juliana, are you good? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. I All I right. I'll shut up again. I'm going, Perfect. I'm going back. From Perfect. So, um, continue. So, we talked about the power of design and now I'm going to talk about the context that we're living now. So, we're living in the ever-changing world. And this is not not something new. We have always been living in an ever-changing world. What is different is that the rate of change is more and more accelerated, especially now with the pandemia, um, everything is accelerated. So at the beginning, when I started giving this talk, I was always referencing to the social currency in China, right? I don't know if you know about that, but basically um, they created a system that is called the, the social credit, it's like a personal scorecard for each of China's 1.4 uh, billion citizens where they track if you created an in infraction in the, in the, I don't know, transit or if you didn't pay something or something else and then you lose your credits in the eyes of the government. Um, and that um, is something that it was seen for a long time as a dystopia. It means a non-desirable future something that we don't want to live in but we ended up living in that right why is this happening why are these things happening and another thing that i usually share before everything is that we are now more and more living um 
and being influenced by techno empires uh, versus governments. Governments, they usually um, regulate a lot our lives, but now, especially in the virtual world and in the digital world, we're not regulated so much by our governments, but more uh, with our, uh, more about our uh, techno empires like Google's, Facebook's, um, and Bezos and stuff. And for example, the people who are thinking about the future is not necessarily uh, only society or only the government anymore, but sometimes are these, um, let's say, stakeholders. So for example, Elon Musk, who created SpaceX, you probably know, you probably remember that. And he said that the trip will take place in 2023rd. Um, and the thing with that is that, is this a desirable future for us or not, right? So, there is um, an image here that I would like to share. Um, and this is about, uh, it's a tweet from Jacqueline Felcher saying that Bezos is talking about building enormous rotating habits in space that can hold up of a million people. Some would be cities, some would be natural, nat natural parks, he said. But who is building this future? Is this something that is desirable by us as a society? Is this something that we are participating in the construction of this future? Or where is this coming from, right? So as an ever-changing world, where is the power? Where is the, 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 the creation of this vision of the future? And, and I think it's interesting that when we create the imagination, when we control the imagination of the future, this is very powerful. And this influences the actual occurrence of the future. So we need to all, let's say, partake um, and bring our expertise and co-create our visions of the future because we're going to get there. If we keep only seeing dystopias like um, uh, the Black Mirrors or movies like, and TV shows like that, we're probably going to end up um, getting to a dystopia like we are in many places. I am from Brazil originally, and in Brazil, it feels like, and I am now in Sydney, but I'm originally from Brazil, it feels like we're living a dystopia now in Brazil with everything that is in place. A far right in, in the government that doesn't take care of their population and stuff like that. Um, and it is like a control of imagination. The reason why we got there is because there was not enough speculation of alternatives of what the future could be like. So there is a challenge. If we don't think about our future, if we don't speculate alternatives, we end up creating decisions and making decisions that we're gonna end up in a place that it's not where we wanna be, but that's the only vision that was created. So we're gonna go ahead there. So this is an invite also for all of us to think about and to uh, think about the future, especially now if you think about what's happening now with COVID. Um, Many things have changed. Many things have, have been amplified. The changes, so there is, a, you probably received that, or you probably seen somewhere, those, that slide that said, oh, um, how did the digital transformation happen in your organization? Was it uh, created by the innovation department? Was it created by, um, I don't know, a consultancy? Or was it created because of COVID, right? Um, so many people are like, okay, everyone is ticking. Yeah, it was because of COVID, right? So the changes are being accelerated now. Things that were, were kind of obvious, but we never implemented are now being implemented. Remote work, everyone, not everyone, but many people are working from home and seeing that this is possible and being more distributed. But there is also the downsides. How is it going to be the future of work from now? How are we going to create um, collaboration between uh, our co-workers or between our cities? How is it going to be the future of health? How is it going to be the future of education if our um, cities are going to be in lockdown coming and going? How is it going to be the future of democracy? How is it going to be the future of travel? Something we're going to be working more um, in, the next, um, in the next phases of this workshop. So basically there is now, um, and I think it's interesting, I was just listening to this, sorry, I'm just gonna go back to this uh, podcast from Penny Wong um, from 7 a.m. Um, and uh, she was saying that there is a big fight now of narratives and you've probably seen that a few, a few um, 
weeks or months ago and this fight of narrative. So the U.S. saying that the virus was created by China and China saying that the, the virus was created by, um, by the U.S., which was crazy. None of them are true, right? And then there is a lot of things that are signals that are emerging. America first, nationalism, protection of borders, the end of privacy. Are we living in an end of privacy of a lot of trackers with us? from the government. In Australia, this was approved as well, right? Having an app that would track you to, to, to protect you from coronavirus and to save you. But is that something that we want? Is this desirable or not? Um, and then I don't believe these things that I'm showing here in the screen, these are signals that are emerging. But I don't think that this is the, the desirable future, is it? Maybe it is for some people, uh, but not for everyone. So how do we think about this future? How do we think about these next steps? And I love this quote um, from Monica Bioskitz. I don't know if you know her. She's an amazing futurist um, and she brings um, a lot of reference from Afrofuturism, which is interesting to get out of the visions of the future from the US or from the Europe that are very American-centered or Eurocentric and having a perspective of futurists from Africa, for example. And she says something that I think it's very interesting. She says, those who control the fantasy control the future. Um, and dystopias can become roadmaps. Um, so she says, I don't even have words to express just how dangerous all this has become, right? Um, and all of these lack of imagination and dreams and participations of uh, as us and society and designers to build this desirable future. Because if we don't articulate them, if we don't speculate them, if we don't influence for desirable futures, we're going to get into non-desirable ones, basically. We're just going to let it happen. Um, and I think that that's why I started my, my, my talk, talking about the power of design. Design is this approach that changes existing conditions into preferred ones. This is not my quote. This is from Herbert Simon. And I think this is the best definition of design, right? And this is the power of design, changing conditions, making it better with using different tools. If it is to create a better um, communication design or systems design or anything. And when I say in influencing systems, I'm talking about democracy, I'm talking about capitalism, I'm talking about anything. And even I'm talking about interaction, this is also something. It could be a point of entry of change. So the last uh, part is like, do you prefer to predict the future or to create it, right? So at ECHOS, we do believe more in creating the future and creating a desirable future. But in order to do that, um, we decided, we started, because we started working a lot with designing futures. So we do projects uh, since I think uh, ECHOS started in 2011 and more and more we have been, we work with uh, designing services, designing digital products, and then we started working uh, also with designing visions of the future for organizations, for industries. Um, and then we started to see, okay, that's, it is the application of design, but in a different way. So we need to understand what it means. And then we created some principles for designing desirable futures so that we don't get into the point, so we don't get into the trap of designing a future that is only comprehensive one stakeholder and then it's not good for society. Um, and then there are a few pieces that I wanted to share. So everything that was one, one thing that we believe, right, is that everything that was not designed by nature was designed by humans, right? Um, and therefore we can redesign everything that is not working, right? So anything, if anything that it was not designed by nature, and I'm saying from money up until a chair or a pen or this computer here in front of us or Zoom, it was designed by us. So it means that we can redesign it if it's not working. It is a major opportunity. And now that we're living a pandemic that everything is putting in check, everything is being re, re, um, and we're rethinking everything. We have the opportunity of everything. It's a major opportunity. It's now, right, that we need to create change. The other part that I think it's important to think about designing futures is that every creation of futures is a political act. And when I say that, I'm not saying a political act as in search as bodies, left or right. I'm saying it's a political act because we are going to be influencing not only you, but others and a range of people. 
So it's from the polis, from the Greek. It's, from, it's something that is for everyone. And because of that, um, ethics and diversity just matters, right? Because sometimes the construction and the building of the future is only taking places um, in places of privilege, right? So the people who are suffering the most in our society are not being able to think or to build their future. And they, are, they just need to accept what is their future vision and live in that vision that was created. So we need to bring people, it needs to be diverse. So with that being said, um, here is our approach for designing futures. Um, we think that there are a few ways first to look about the future. So you can look about the future thinking about that the future is predictive. So you're going to be looking at trends. You're going to try and analyzing signals and stuff like that. There's also another way of looking into futures that is to, about speculation. So you're going to be creating alternatives of the future. And then you're going to be saying, okay, this is interesting. This is not interesting. And then there is another one that is an, um, creating futures with intention, right? Which is, which is something that you're going to be driving something. Our way of thinking about futures is to combine those approaches because only using what is predictive, history has proven us that they don't work, right? Um, so for example, I don't know if you know that famous quote about Margaret Thatcher that she said um, before being a prime minister that in her time, there would never be a time where a woman would become a prime minister. And then she became a prime minister herself. So she was predicting because she was following the signals of her times. And because she was following the signal of her times, this would never happen. But there was an inflection of what the future might be. There wasn't a speculation. There was an intention of future that made her become a prime minister, right? So it's interesting because if we leave the future only to predictions, we're going to get into possible futures, but not necessarily desirable ones. So we need to combine these approaches so that's how um, we redesign, that's our approach of designing futures. So you can see here, if you know a little bit about um, the approach of designing future, you probably heard about the future cone, right? Um, so the future cone, there is, um, there is always the possible, the plausible. I'm just gonna show you, jump to another slide just so that you understand that. Um, so when we think about uh, designing futures, this is, this is the thing. Um, you think about possible futures, you think about plausible futures, you think about probable futures, and you think about preferred futures. In order to get to preferred futures, you possibly need to understand what is possible, what is plausible, what is probable, but actually what is our intention, what is our desire as a society. So that's how we work. We're combining these approaches, the prediction, the speculation, and the desirability, right? What is intentional um, from us. So, and here our, 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 on, the, on the top, you can see our premises and our principles. So the design of futures needs to come from people, um, not necessarily only from technology. That's the, the opposite of it. Also technology, of course, drives, but it's not from there. It's from people. It needs to be emergent. It needs to be happening now, right? It needs to be coming from weak signals. It also needs to bring ethics and diversity. Um, and we need to see the future always as a possibility and not as a roadmap that is only going to be like that. And then here on the bottom, these are the phases that we usually go through in a project um, when we are designing futures for an organization, right? So these are all the steps. We always start analyzing social needs. Then we identify the emergencies of the future using weak signals. Then we exercise future alternatives. Then we set the intention then we create a vision of the future. Then we do a future calibration. We prototype a future vision. We see how people react to it and then we can adjust in just in case. Then we understand, then we go, this is future visualization until now. And then on the other half of the cone is what we call the future activation, right? And then we have the future vision and then we have now. So we understand what's the gap? How do we get there? Um, then we run a roadmap, we build a roadmap for steps for our desirable futures. Then we create a few experiments that are the minimum, um, 
viable futures, right? Some experiments that will activate uh, these futures, then we test, recalibrate, and that's kind of a circle. So we see um, our role as designers um, of desirable futures is that we need to um, observe the emergence of behavioral and technological, um, uh, let's say, signals and act as interventionists. So with that, we would accelerate the time to explore and foster possible and intentional futures. Um, and of course, not autocratic, uh, initially diverse, um, because they are gonna be con con constructed in a collaborative and social way. So this is really important whenever we are working with that. So I'll share two quick cases. So one case, we work with a healthcare um, partner, a pharma industry, and we did all of these processes that I just shared with you. We were analyzing social, um, so we were analyzing the behavior, the needs, um, then we were understanding the future emergencies, then we were speculating futures, then we were creating a vision of the future. And in the vision of the future, we got into this one. That is, uh, and, 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 and it was like a predictive health. Um, so we created a, this vision for them um, and it was in the, in the, the pharma uh, area of cardio, uh, vascular area. So we were creating a vision of the future that would be real time data intelligence relating the individual and the environment to clusters of predictions and personalizations. Um, so there will be a new, so for that to happen, the roadmap it has that they needed a new distribution based on customization and decentralization meeting specific demands. And consequently, a different inventory dynamic should be created as a resource center to customize and plan replacements. Um, there will be optimized logistics to bring treatment closer to the locality of people and opposition to relocating people and two centers. So this is kind of like the vision and a bit of the role that it's very simplified here because I cannot share all the details of this project. Um, but one of the, the prototypes that we did to articulate, let's say, and, and test if this future vision worked because it was a future vision of 15 years, right? It's not like now, it was a, it was a bit further away. We created something that we call the artifact of the future. And as an artifact of the future, we created this. So it was VAS as a central artifact of the future. So um, it's a medical device that you ingest that has nanorobots, that, that actually discharges nanorobots in your bloodstream. And we activate telemedicine and new health ecosystem um, through collective funding with real-time assistance and a geolocalized organ print logistics and special care, right? Sorry, there's a word there in Portuguese that I forgot to translate. Um, so this is something that we were working on and this is an artifact of the future. So we share this with the stakeholders who are, that are part of this ecosystem of cardio and we ask them, what do you feel, how do you feel about that, right? That's something interesting. What are your concerns? And they could bring their perspective. So these art, it's like a prototype, like when you are working with design and any kind of uh, uh, structure, the creative structures. So we were using sort of like, we were also another way of prototyping futures to create storytelling, to create, and we usually do what we call um, instead of science fiction, is design fiction, right? Um, and it's basically a movie a story that, that shows. So we also created a few videos sharing this experience, how it would be like. And we were sharing to our, to this um, co uh, cohort, uh, to this industry, all the different parts of the industry, not only the patients, but also the doctors, the caretakers, um, the pharmaceutical companies, the, the health, private healthcare, public healthcare, what does it help? And then we receive feedback. So basically the value of designing futures for these kind of, in these kind of projects for an organization such like that, is that first you help to, to build a future vision. Um, you bring inspiration um, to what is desirable. You, uh, you bring abstraction as well. So you speculate of what might happen in the future. You also nudge and influence what needs to converge to influence this future. So if we need to get there, these are desirable futures, what do we need to do now? So then there is micro projects that start to happen now. And then you create these kind of milestones. And then there is this part of the future activation. So we, we design um, projects that could happen in one year that is a minimum viable future, right? It's the first step into the future. Then we define KPIs and then we define the executors. Who is going to be these kind of um, executors. Um, 
And then, um, so lastly, um, what I wanted to share is like another case from WorkSafe. You, you, if you are from Australia, you probably know WorkSafe. Um, we worked with them to design a future for um, 2049. It was a very far-fetched future. And the way how we did it, we understood a few signals. So these are the signals that are in yellow that were emerging through research, empathetic research, signal research, we're gonna be doing that. And then we created a story for the possible future um, and a storyline for the preferable future. So if we follow the line, the timeline of what is possible, just analyzing signals and trends, this is where we're gonna get, right? And this was the possible future. If we follow the storyline of a preferred future, another story of where we would get. Um, and then with that, the idea for WorkSafe, uh, sorry, it's 2048. The idea for WorkSafe is to move from a recovery focused on illness and injury to a well-being, to predictive well-being, right? And this became a guideline for WorkSafe. And they're working now doing micro projects to get to this desirable future.